think we should probably get started now. Um, we're very lucky this week to have Janet Rathner, who is currently a postdoc. Does that sound annoying? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so Janet is currently a postdoc at the Department of Cognitive Science, Communication and Linguistics, um, Centre for Hybrid Intelligence, which many of you will be very familiar with. Um, and of course, Janet has a very, very special background combining physics and studio art as her first two degrees. And she's been doing some incredible work, some uh, seed funded project work um, related to the IMT. Um, we have a recording today, so you'll be able to review the talk as well online afterwards. And yeah, with that said, thank you so much for coming over to us, Janet. I'll let you take over here. Um, I'm glad it could finally work. I was supposed to talk in the spring, but I was sick then. Um, so, uh, first of all, um, as you can see by my, my first slide, uh, this is a collaborative effort. <laughs> I have been very fortunate um, in my projects uh, to work with many talented researchers. A lot of them were in the room. Um, uh, and I promise that for those who have heard me talk before, there is some new stuff in here that you haven't heard, so it won't be a complete repeat. Um, but uh, I will be keeping it at a, a higher level so that those who are not so familiar with the work can, can get a taste of the different things that I've been doing with respect to um, a particular game that um, I uh, led the development of during my PhD called Kreia, um, and a variant of it called Kreia Visions, um, which has to do with the scalable AI-enhanced games for fostering and assessing creativity. And if you hold out to the end, I actually have some takeaways, free takeaways for anyone who wants to look at something. So uh, <laughs> keep your attention peaked for the end. Um, okay, so uh, as uh, Christine mentioned, um, I have uh, an interdisciplinary background. I'll briefly say that now um, because there are a lot of different things going on in um, the projects. Um, I have, okay, anyways. Um, so I have my degrees in physics and studio art from the States, from the University of Virginia. I moved here on a Fulbright Fellowship uh, back in 2015 to study how complex phenomena can be visually. I stayed and did my master's. I'm a candidate in, at the Niels Bohr Institute, I'm looking at citizen science, games, and computational fluid dynamics. And I just finished an interdisciplinary PhD here at Aarhus. Um, it was in ICT. Uh, I did the work when I was at uh, the Center for Hybrid Intelligence, and Kristen Tulin supervised uh, the writing of it. So that's short background. Um, and right now, I'm a, a postdoc in Kagsai, but I sit and I'm working at the Center for Hybrid Intelligence. Some of you may know it, some of you don't. It's over in management. Um, and I'll briefly say that in at the center, uh, we, we look at several different research areas. You see here, for me, I'm looking at human skills and competencies and also some of this hybrid intelligence for industry. Uh, today, I'm focusing very <laughs> on a small <laughs> aspect here that's way too much to talk about. So amplifying human soft skills with AI, game-based uh, skill assessment, and citizen science. If you have interest in any other stuff, you can talk to me or also Jacob Shearson about that. Um, so the agenda is to briefly talk a couple words about hybrid intelligence, citizen science, and games say what it is, and then talk about this main project, CREA, AI-enhanced game-based portfolio for fostering assessing creativity, and then um, talking about a spin-off project that came from it, an AI-enhanced public engagement tool uh, for societal issues. And this is a, a work in progress diagram here, but I just thought it could be nice to position some of these topics. Um, so I am interested in the intersection of uh, games, digital games, uh, to reach out to the general public and engage them with research questions that falls into this area of citizen science or public participation in research. Um, and I am particularly interested in how uh, AI can enhance those interactions. Um, and I have been focusing on this area called uh, casual creators with a purpose. So it's AI enhanced games that allow anyone in the public to participate in certain topics, be it uh, fundamental research or uh, public engagement around yeah, topics like really sustainable development goals. So broadly, hybrid intelligence is looking at optimal synergies between humans and algorithms. That's <laughs> leaving it at a very high level there. Um, and there are many different aspects of it. It's interdisciplinary. It can help uh, upskilling of individuals. And uh, particularly in my work, I, I look at digital interfaces. On one side, 
You can look at uh, nearly all forms of artificial intelligence that we have today, where there's some human comp component in the loop of the process. Uh, so there's always a human involved now. Uh, there's some research that's moving out towards a human out of the loop on this side, so autonomous operation, um, which is focusing on AI as a disruptive technology, uh, which can have some positive effects, but also has opportunities for a lot of negative effects, like um, uh, increasing bias, perverse instantiation, and de-skilling of individuals. Then on the other side, there's a big push for what's called human-centered AI, so AI that's really focused on uh, the human that's using it and uh, keeping the human in the loop. Um, but there's also a focus in that community, it's in the HCI community predominantly, um, where AI is the tool. So it's the human and then the AI is the tool and the human is controlling it in every step. So um, hybrid intelligence you can sort of think of as in the middle here uh, between um, a disruptive technology and AI as a tool. So it's still trying to take advantage of some of the potentials of that disruption while still putting a lot of emphasis on uh, the human components. So that's at a glance. If you want to read more or hear more about that, you can. Um, since we're also located, the, the Center at the Department of Management, we're looking at um, the intersection of AI, uh, human-computer interaction, also future work, so, so how these technologies are affecting future work, and then ISM is information system management. So there's just a brief at a glance on hybrid intelligence. Um, so when and why is it needed? You don't need it for everything, sure. Um, but uh, in particular, I'm focused on learning soft skills, um, artistic creativity, flexibility, imagination, intuition, sensibility. So that area is my um, particular uh, focus of interest um, for hyper intelligence. As I said in the beginning, I'm interested mostly at a, a collective level, um, how, how to explore these types of interactions. And uh, from my, my master's and my previous work, I've had quite a bit of experience with citizen science. Um, and so that's broadly engaging the general public in tasks that uh, researchers would typically do themselves. Um, that's in contrast to citizen psych science, I put those two up here. So citizen science could be going out and collecting water samples, or it could be participating in all sorts of natural science research questions. Um, they also have it in humanities and different areas too. Um, citizen psych science is where the people, the participants, are the focus of the research question. So you have the researchers looking in on the participants who are doing all sorts of activities. Um, some of you here may know, for that, um, some of you here may know the Skill Lab project. This is not my project, <laughs> but it's uh, been uh, at the center. I have a couple co-authors uh, in the room. Um, so this is the first project that uh, we did at uh, the center. Um, and this is citizen psych science, uh, so it was developing a game to reach out uh, to the general public um, to uh, understand more about certain cognitive abilities. And so this is a, an example of what a citizen psych science project is. And from that, uh, in my work, um, I have taken that same idea of um, a game that uh, we have the, the general public play and we gather information on their behavior, in this case creativity. Um, and developed a portfolio of games to uh, assess aspects of creativity. Um, and so that's sort of the, the dual uh, area here, digital creativity assessment, and then also fostering creativity through computational human AI co-creativity. And uh, right now, these fields are pretty disjoint. Uh, so in one community, you have psychologists, psychometric experts, um, who are studying how to assess creativity from a, a hardcore psychological perspective, you could say. Um, and that's really important in schools and in work and for all different types of research problems when you want to evaluate whether a tool or a um, intervention can help uh, boost creativity. On the other side, there are a bunch of researchers in human-computer interaction that are are looking at and building tools that um, are really innovative, using all sorts of new technology um, to explore new creative processes. And these two fields are somewhat disjoint. And what I have been quite interested in and continue to be interested in is looking at the overlap between those two. So how can we take the knowledge that we have from uh, psychometric research 
and apply, incorporate that into the new technologies that are built to foster and um, uh, foster and um, foster creativity. And then, how can we help those new help researchers in the psychometric area learn more about those new technologies? And so, briefly, in the the, the HCI field, um, we have uh, we have this breakdown of tools for creativity. Um, the first one is um, creativity support tools, so tools that are built to support an individual's user, in an individual's creativity. We have um, a computational creativity, so that's AI researchers build algorithms that make creative artifacts, uh, so that doesn't have to have any human involved, but that's just some algorithm that can uh, make a creative output creative output there. Mm -hmm. And then you have co-creativity, so HC HCI and AI researchers building tools to support co-creation. And uh, though that's the general breakdown, as you see from the HCI community, this doesn't involve creativity assessment. It's really, it has to do with the tool and the type of interaction. So what uh, I, I've been interested in doing in this work um, is uh, creating a, a portfolio of games um, that uh, can help us uh, assess creativity of uh, individuals um, with increasing product complexity, where this increasing uh, product complexity comes from uh, AI enhancement. So, so this co-creative area so the purpose um, is to start with some uh, low dimensional uh, assessments that we typically are using today and then move towards more high dimensional spaces uh, utilizing co-creative tools uh, for um, a more uh, complex and uh, interesting uh, outcome for the creativity assessment. So, most of you know creativity is pretty important. That's why I'm interested in it, interested in many different domains. Um, and then from a psychometric, ex uh, psychometric perspective, uh, it has previously sort of been thought of as very mysterious um, and a little bit fluffy. So when you talk about creativity, it's hard to define, it's hard to come to a consensus on how to measure it. There are some different areas uh, for that, which I'll go into, um, but uh, now, uh, we actually do have some, some good measures for, for creativity. Um, before I get into a definition of it, uh, there are two different frameworks which are nice to look at briefly. Um, there's uh, the, the uh, C framework, so big C, it's actually four Cs, but I'll just talk about two of them. Big C is a, sort of like a creative genius, eminence, world-class accomplishment, so you can think of creativity in that sense for a, like a Picasso or a, um, a Mozart. And then you have little c creativity, so that's everyday creativity, hobbies, ideas, jokes. I'm focused on this little c creativity, so that's an individual creativity. You also have the four Ps, person, product, and uh, person, product, process, and press. So these are different aspects of creativity. You can have a creative uh, product, um, a person could be considered creative, uh, a process, different, um, function strategies, and then uh, press is sort of the environment. I just needed an extra P in there. Um, and <laughs> in, in my content, uh, I'm interested mostly in uh, the, the first three, product, uh, person, and process. So there's a standard definition of creativity, something that's novel and useful. Um, there are a lot more nuances to that, uh, but that's uh, generally where, where we stand now. Um, and with regards to measuring creativity, uh, there are a few different techniques. This last one is my focus, but I'll briefly tell you about a couple of the other techniques, and then that will lead into why we're developing these game-based measures. Um, so the first uh, technique is called consensual assessment, um, and it often uses experts as judges. Uh, so this is a subjective assessment. So say I draw something on the board, and then it's uh, maybe it's good for me, maybe it's not. Um, and then you have a bunch of experts and people who are good at drawing things on the board um, who are evaluating that. And you can do that in technology, you can do it in literature, all sorts of different areas. Um, these are usually uh, both uh, 
valid and reliable ways of assessing creativity if you're using experts, um, but it's very difficult to do uh, because you need to find those experts to assess it. Um, there are also some, some standardized tests for the concepts of divergent thinking and convergent thinking. Um, so, so divergent thinking is, as it says, diverging from a topic. Um, and you can sort of think of that as the ability to explore ideas, so coming up with lots of ideas, whereas convergent thinking is deciding what to do with those ideas. Uh, so that could be selecting a best idea and then progressing forward with it. And then, yes, so on, uh, in divergent thinking, uh, there's no correct answer, whereas in convergent thinking, there's typically a best answer. So how are people assessing these? Um, since about the 1950s, there have been some standardized tests. One is called the, the TTCT figural, that's Torrance Test for Creative Thinking. This, that's what you see here. Um, participants are given these circles, and then they're asked to make as many different uh, drawings as they can with them. See it on the right. There's also a, a, a verbal task, the alternative uses task. Is anyone familiar with that? Yes, a few people nodding their head. Uh, so you're given, the participants are given a um, object, say here a brick, um, and they're asked to come up with many different alternative uses for it. F with respect to uh, convergent thinking, um, the most well-known test is called the remote <coughs> associates test. Um, it's really not a very good test, uh, but uh, essentially you have these three items here and the participant has to, uh, to come up themselves with, with a, um, a word that draws all three together. So you have cottage, Swiss, cake, that would be cheese. Um, and so in particular, these two, uh, the alternative uses test and the remote associates test, which are the most common tests use out, used for divergent and convergent thinking, are also heavily language-based. So that can be difficult for um, having both uh, culturally fair assessments of creativity um, and also for uh, assessing the correct answers. This is easy to assess, to assess a correct answer. This is a little bit harder. Now we're getting better at it automatically. So with regards to any of these tests, uh, there is general concern over the validity, reliability, and the fairness of it. Um, and the issues with some of these cur current assessments that I've mentioned is that um, there are only weak correlations between the tests themselves. So you have lots of, a handful of different divergent thinking tests, and they correlate weakly with each other. Um, so you're not really sure what you're getting in each one. Uh, it's difficult to operationally disentangle divergent thinking and convergent thinking. Uh, there is an absence of consensus among researchers about the construct validity, so the construct definition, what is creativity. And there's a perceived lack of real world predictive power. Uh, so we have these standardized tests that are quite simple um, and they're used in many different contexts uh, around the world. Um, but they don't translate so well into everyday life, which is where you actually want to know if people can be creative. Um, and lastly, there's a reliance on time-consuming subjective scoring of creativity tests, uh, responses by, res of these responses by humans, so they often um, are reliant on people sitting there scoring them themselves. Um, and there's also a lack of battery-based approaches. There are a few battery-based approaches, and by that I mean lots of tests given to the students, but you run into problems like um, testing fatigue, uh, researcher effect, uh, when you have students sit down and have to do two or three hours of tests so that you can get a robust portfolio. So how can digital games and AI help solve this problem? So on one side, uh, games are mostly visual um, versus language-based, uh, so that's one plus. They are more casual and natural and have an immersed behavior, so that's different than a typical standard test. Um, and they offer a fine grained metrics for assessing uh, creative products and processes. And so by this, uh, when you remember at the beginning I was saying the four Cs, in this case, um, the typical standard tests just give you the final product. So it's uh, what, what are, what's the final image that someone has drawn uh, in those circles, or what's the final word or sentence that they provided for the use of a brick. Um, whereas in gameplay, you can really dig into the process. So how are people moving around and getting from one solution to another? 
AI can help in a few different areas as well. Uh, one of them is clustering the data. So when you have large corpus of uh, responses, you can use it um, for looking at different clusters of player behavior, for example. There's automated scoring. Um, so there's some really cool work. I won't talk so much about it now. Um, for scoring um, verbal responses, something called semantic distance, um, which we also use in our work. So that's looking at the semantic distance between responses in a verbal test, like how far is a doorstop from uh, some for the use of a brick to breaking a window, those sorts of things. Um, and there's also some cool work now in also automating the uh, drawing tasks, so scoring of the drawing tasks. Um, lastly, and one of my big areas of interest, is how can AI help many people create more complex outputs? As you saw by both uh, the, the little drawings and the text-based responses, text-based responses can be complex, but in the visual field, the results are not very complex uh, if you don't have great drawing skills. And so I'm really interested in how certain types of algorithms, in particular generative adversarial networks, so image blending, can help participants uh, make a more uh, complex output in a creative task. So with these benefits of games, why aren't we using more games to assess creativity? Well, as part of my work, I did a review on this. So I looked, and this is published in the Creativity Research Journal, Digital Games for Creativity Assessment, Strengths, Weaknesses, and Opportunities. We reviewed um, 11 different games uh, in this uh, work. Um, and it was very interesting that uh, all of the games except two um, were published only in HCI uh, journals. So you can see that there's a lot of work in making these prototypes, work in progress games to assess creativity in an HCI community, but there was not much crossover into the psychometric assessment community. The conclusions from the review were here um, to develop a robust nonverbal assessment for convergent thinking. It's one of the bigger challenges in the field. Most of these games on the previous page addressed aspects of divergent thinking, so lots of different solutions. Um, we should focus uh, or aim to deliberately construct games that explore a span from simple and stylized to complex and real life events. Uh, and that's because uh, it's very, first of all, it's very difficult uh, to create a scenario that will um, replicate a real world event for us to look at the creativity at play there. Um, but what is quite interesting is to see what aspects um, of that real world creativity can be captured in more, in simpler and um, more stylized interactions. Um, and lastly, uh, there's an emphasis on separate efforts to be combined into a comprehensive suite that goes back to talking about the battery of tasks. One test alone, one test will not stand alone. Um, to assess creativity, so you really need a, a, a battery of tasks. So after this review, myself and all of the authors that you saw on the first page uh, decided uh, to build a suite for assessing creativity. Um, and this was a big task <laughs> to, to create a game-based portfolio. This is what it looks like. You can all play it. It's freely available online. Um, it consists of four games, uh, Tiles, Ideas, Blender, and Logic. Um, here, uh, Crea Tiles and Crea Blender are real games, whereas uh, Crea Logic and Crea Ideas are gamified tasks. Crea Ideas is essentially a gamified version, gamified version of the alternative uses task that we use to compare against our new metrics. And then Crea Logic is a uh, matrix abstract reasoning test. Um, it's similar to Raven progressive matrices, if you're familiar with that. Uh, and the reason why we included that instead of the remote associates task is because, um, first of all, there's a lot of debate as to what that uh, remote associates task actually does. And the literature also says that um, there's quite a bit of overlap between more uh, general cognitive abilities, for example, abstract reasoning in the convergent thinking aspects of our work, and we didn't find correlations with that. Um, so I will go into a little bit more detail on the two games because they're the most fun part. Um, the, the premise for each of these is that they have divergent thinking modes. So they have those come up with lots of ideas to a single prompt. They have convergent thinking modes, which is 
select from a set and narrow in down on the best solution, and then open play modes. So those are more free for all to see what people will generate. Um, and the big aspect here is that they're contextually homogeneous. And so that means um, in each of the environments, the, these modes are being tested with the same basic gameplay. So not having one assessment for divergent thinking in one type of gameplay, and then a test for convergent thinking in a totally different game environment. Um, and both of these games are set up in that parallel. So uh, Christian has given some talks here, I believe, on uh, the creative foraging game. So that was the, uh, the basis for, uh, for Create Tiles. So that's a game here where you have these uh, 10 blocks and they have to all stay connected and um, they need to be, uh, they can be moved one by one, move one block here, one block here. Uh, and so we designed as an adaptation from that, we designed these three different modes. Um, in the convergent thinking mode, participants are given these uh, four starting shapes and then um, a target shape, and they have to pick which starting shape they think uh, will be the shortest distance to the target shape, select it and recreate it. We have several modes in the divergent thinking. Um, the, the most fun, which I'll show you later, is where we ask participants uh, to make as many different dog-like figures as they can out of the blocks. And then uh, Crea Blender is uh, the AI enhanced aspect of this. So participants um, engage in image blending. Uh, so we use what's called a generative adversarial network. I'm happy to talk more about that later, but essentially it's just a, um, a, an algorithm that allows participants to blend images together into interesting new images. Um, and we had the same modes here, where participants were given, instead of the tiles, they're given five different images, and they're asked to blend as many different animal-like uh, images as possible. In the, you saw here, the, the convergent thinking mode, participants are asked to choose which one of these three uh, sets of images uh, created the target image, and then blend them together. With regards to some of these aspects that we talked about previously, um, the divergent thinking, convergent thinking, and open play modes have been carefully designed with contextually homogeneous environments. This has a novel CT mode, that uh, the selection and creation phase, uh, which is more closely aligned to the original uh, convergent thinking characterizations uh, from the literature, and the double diamond creative processes. Uh, so. In design and creative research, you have this double diamond over here where you go through phases of divergent, convergent, divergent, convergent um, processes. And so what we have uh, developed with the selection and the generation phase is more closely aligned with that than previously the conventional remote associates test. The two separate games, Tiles and Blender, um, have a deliberate transition between creativity and a contained and unrestricted state space. So in the, the tiles aspect, uh, it's well contained. There are something like 36,000 shapes that be, can be created, whereas in Blender, it's unrestricted. It's a battery-based approach with automated scoring in a freely accessible package. So as I said, anyone can play it. And then with respect to fairness, there's visual manipulation versus verbal to make it more culturally agnostic. Okay, I'll go quickly here. Yes. Um, last fall, we did a, a moderately sc moderate scale study uh, with 400 students at Penn State University with one of our collaborators, Roger Beatty. Um, and participants create uh, completed CREA as well as multiple other uh, measures of self-reported creativity, openness, creative behavior, creative self-efficacy. Um, and the results were moderate. Uh, we had correlations ranging from 0.1 to 0.04. Um, these are, in the creativity field, not so bad, um, because as I said previously, a lot of these measures that they have out there don't correlate well with themselves. So, I, I mean, you're, you're measuring something up against uh, a ruler that's moving, <laughs> more or less. Uh, and so this is very different than in other areas. There's still a lot of work to be done. Um, but, uh, but these were promising uh, correlations for, for the work. Uh, and that paper is, we just got some very positive reviews back, so it's in revisions now, um, also in the Creativity Research Journal. 
And so now I'll show you a little bit about the data. <laughs> so what does it actually look like? What did people make? Um, remember the task I said uh, in the divergent thinking, participants have to uh, consider how many different dogs they can make out of these 10 blocks. And so I'll briefly show you here some of the responses. Uh, do they see any different types of dogs? Anyone want to volunteer what they see? Go ahead. There's face-up dogs, there's profile dogs, there's profile dogs left and right, there's dogs from above. Something or like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're pretty good. <laughs> so it was very interesting and exciting for us to see um, that uh, there was a wide diversity uh, that you could get uh, out of some, such as a simple prompt is create as many dogs as possible. Um, the downside, I say here very freely for, for the research, is that uh, we didn't have people cluster them themselves. So we did that after the fact. Um, so we didn't have participants give the name to their dog. Um, and that's yeah. something that we will certainly do differently in the next studies because um, the analysis that we did was, of course, post hoc. And so we can only say so much. We had several raters looking at it, um, but it's not the uh, creator's intention. Yes, and this is also interesting. A couple of our readers got very specific. This one has a poodle, that one has a, has a Doberman. Okay. Um, but it is very promising that in a well-contained space with a well-contained prompt, you can still reach such diversity. Um, another interesting aspect here is that um, we looked at player behavior, so how they moved in the space, um, which is something I came back to before, looking at process instead of just the product. Um, and so uh, here you can see uh, we have these different clusters. Uh, some people stayed quite close to uh, one type of dog moving left and right. Uh, other ones were more diverse here. Okay, very briefly, I'll talk about Crea Blender. Um, we're in the, so in the first <laughs> publication for Crea Tiles, we didn't analyze the Blender data because there was just so much to look at in yeah. the, uh, the first data set. Um, Crea Blender, we have previously done a couple of uh, pilot studies uh, and work in progress publications. Um, we are now analyzing the data from the 400 participants, but I'll just briefly talk about the, the uh, pilot studies here. They both published in um, uh, HCI fields. So we did a pilot study on Crea Blender back in 2020. Um, before, we said we could go forward with this as a tool for a creativity assessment, we had to make sure that it um, uh, particularly afforded a sense of control. Uh, the players have a sense of control over the interface. We want to make sure that if we're looking at a creative process that they actually know what they're doing and it's not just random actions. Um, and that we can look at different types of uh, player behavior. This was published in Kai Play, so we also wanted to see if it uh, had a playful experience. And here I'll just show a, a quickly a couple of uh, plots that we had from the first study. Uh, from this, uh, this is the convergent thinking mode. Uh, the participants uh, were moving in towards a specific target. This was the target image. Um, and what we're looking at here uh, is how close they're getting to that target image. And what's interesting is that players made at most two wrong moves before making a right move. So that indicates that they were self-correcting themselves and they got it, had a sense of how the system was working. With respect to varying player behavior, um, we were looking at the concepts of exploration and exploitation, so how they explored a space, um, how big the movements were, and then exploitation, so um, smaller refinement movements. Um, and the big takeaway from this plot uh, is that players had different behavior in the convergent thinking mode, the divergent thinking mode, and the open play mode, where, is, where in the convergent thinking mode, they had much more exploitative behavior, so they were honing in on a particular um, target, making small movements in the system, where uh, in the open play and the uh, divergent um, mode, they were making uh, much larger steps in that space. So that would be moving the sliders in greater distances before generating the image versus moving them slowly um, in small spaces uh, before generating the image. So the main takeaways for CREA is that it's a theoretically driven large-scale game-based creativity assessment suite. 
The design principles, it includes contextually homogeneous convergent thinking and divergent thinking tasks and, a compl and complex product spaces. It's AI-assisted product generation and automated assessment. And the next steps, uh, we have a collaboration with uh, University College London. They're actually going to be having um, their participants in a microdosing study play Kraya, which is exciting. Um, we are setting up uh, longitudinal studies with students in the US, Denmark, and the UK. Um, and we also have some small seed funding from BSS for a feedback study to look at the role of feedback uh, in Kraya. Okay, very briefly, in the next uh, four minutes, um, I'll talk about the second project, Kraya Visions. Um, looks a lot like Kraya Blender here. Uh, it actually was a spin out of Kraya Blender. So when you're developing this, this, uh, this game, um, for image blending um, within the uh, Kraya Blender game, we had to have very specific requirements on the images we were using. We actually worked with an art historian, Laura Philipson, she's on our collaborators list, um, uh, to figure out what specific features in the images should we have, like no background, a central figure, all of these different things, so we can really focus on how that one image is created. That's all well and good, but it's also not as fun. Um, so we began exploring other possibilities uh, for using a similar tool, in particular uh, for fostering dialogues around complex topics like the Sustainable Development Goals. And so that's how Credit Visions uh, was uh, engaged. And uh, that's, it's been a project in conjunction with AI for Good, Global Summit, uh, that's from, from the UN back in 2020. Uh, we had an event with Prima Folkmal um, last uh, fall, so that's the Danish People's Climate Summit, and this past summer we just did a big event with a Creativity and Cognition Conference in Venice. There are some other projects out there that you could say fall into this area of casual creators with a purpose. There's one called This Climate Does Not Exist, um, where, where you can look at climate change effects on particular areas, so you have one picture and then you can say bring a flood up on it or uh, make it look like there was a big fire. Um, these use generative models. Um, there's also another project called Earth Mood. Um, this is a video that has these uh, generated images over time. These are a hybrid between HDI projects and uh, citizen science, AI for good, public engagement. Um, we were inspired by things similar to this, but wanted to create a more uh, systematic, um, scaffolded interaction with participants. And so this, again, is back to what I said. Uh, we, we did our first project with AI for Good in 2020. Um, and we have a paper published on this uh, in Creative and Cognition. Happy to share that if it's of interest where participants um, were given starting images and they were asked to blend what they thought their future could look like um, and then categorize it as either more utopian or more dystopian. This was really the, the beta version of it. Um, and uh, after this, we created a, uh, a much more comprehensive version for uh, the, the Danish People's Climate Summit last year, uh, which not only had participants blend the images, uh, but allowed them to give their images titles and captions um, and uh, rank them on a variety of different slider settings, utopian to dystopian, man-made um, uh, to natural-made, reversible, non-reversible. Um, and we also have interviews with the winners, um, these different things. Uh, and so that's a much broader data set uh, that we have from that. And we have looked at for example, semantic analysis on uh, their titles and captions, sorry, sentiment analysis on their titles and captions uh, versus uh, how they rated their, their images on the sliders to see are they giving uh, corresponding answers in text to how they do it in slider values. And then these are just a few of the results. We had several hundred uh, students, 500 from, I believe it was in Middlefart last year, 500 students from there and then few hundred from the general public as well. Um, based on that initial paper, uh, I was approached at Cray Visions, sorry, I was approached at Creativity and Cognition to do a similar event in the city of Venice this summer. So from 2021 to 20, spring 2022, we developed a new version of it, um, Cray Visions Venice. We trained our own GAN in this case based on uh, images from Venice. 
and we had 13 pop-up events over the city, um, and uh, we did an exhibition here, you can see it down there, uh, at the Creativity and Cognition Conference, and I have postcard takeaways <laughs> from, the, from the exhibition, if someone wants to see what the images created by participants of the general public um, about what their city could look like in the future. We also had a new mode here, um, instead of just the sliding, sorry, I'll hurry, uh, participants um, could preview the direction um, which they wanted to go with the images. Uh, so you can see down here is if you moved more of one aspect, the style of the image, one aspect, this content. If you moved in that direction, what would it look like? Then you could click on it and regenerate it. Uh, fortunately, I don't have time for this, um, but if anyone's interested in knowing more how the game the, the GAN was trained, or some of the trade-offs in uh, making decisions on training again, please ask. And also, we can look at the player process and progression as they created their images. Um, next <coughs> up for this, we have a Creators Paris coming up. Um, that's a small grant funded by Circle U, um, and we'll be working with the Learning Planet Institute and have an event similar to what we did in Venice at the uh, Learning Planet Festival at the end of January. Um, and we're also interested in doing a Cray Visions Aarhus, obviously. Um, and we have had initial discussions with Aarhus in, sorry, State International School uh, in the fall of 2023. Um, so starting something with students uh, to see how they could um, imagine what their future would look like. And that's it. Thank you.